Father God, thank you so very much for giving us this opportunity to come together. We brothers and sisters could uh, spend some time in meditation of your word. Especially as we're going to discuss one of the crucial topics, the importance of the law and the vote or obedience to the law and Christian's relationship to the law. I pray that your spirit may be granted to us, your spirit of that grants us the freedom, your spirit that reveals us the truth may walk amongst us, Lord, especially we ask for your special anointing upon Pastor Dan as he's going to teach. And I uh, also ask you to lead us and guide us in our discussions so that our discussions may add value uh, to each and everyone, uh, every participant here and that spiritual walk. Your name be exalted through everything we do and lead us into the truth and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Well, thank you for all for joining us uh, again. And uh, we will carry on with uh, the subject that we started last week. And so I'm, I do want to complete it this week. Uh, even though I must confess that uh, uh, I needed much, much more preparation. So, uh, uh, one moment, let me just, right, here we are. Yes, I, I, I needed uh, much more preparation. There's so much to talk about uh, in, in a subject like this. Um, I decided to take this subject from a slightly different angle. Uh, from the usual. Uh, so uh, let me see if I'm able to make sense uh, with what I discussed with regards to the, uh, you know, the law of the Ten Commandments. Now, I must say that I'm sure you will have questions. Uh, we are not going to completely solve, you know, every last uh, question about this. Some questions may need extra explanation uh, and that will take time and I don't think we can really uh, do justice to it on a platform like this. So if you should have questions, I am willing to discuss that perhaps individually so that I can take time to explain as much as I am able to understand. So I thought I'll just make those two submissions before we proceed to a very short review from what we discussed last week. Uh, I'll start with, you remember I mentioned about grace and we discussed grace in a Bible study sometime back. And uh, uh, the conclusion we came to was when we talk about grace, the grace of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we are under grace, not under the law, which is a scriptural which is uh, mentioned in the scripture, that does not mean to say that we don't live under any standard, that we are so free that we can do anything we want. I think that is uh, something that we have concluded, and I hope uh, uh, that has been made clear. But the question we were asking, or rather uh, that led us to the question, what is the standard? Right. So like we uh, mentioned last time, uh, many feel that the standard is the Ten Commandments because it is so clearly codified and given in the in the in the in the Old Testament. And Israel as a nation was under that. And so we feel that the Ten Commandments continue on and we feel that is the standard. Uh, now. Of course, when we talk about that being the standard, some people will think only nine are applicable. Some would even go to the extent of saying only six are applicable. Anyway, we won't get into all those controversies. But uh, I was wanting to take a bigger, bigger picture approach. And that, and that I introduced last time by saying, what is the purpose for creation? What was God's intention to create human beings? Uh, what was his idea behind relating with human beings? Uh, and I, uh, I read from the scripture or in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, where the apostle, I think, makes it very clear 
what God's intention was to create. And the reason I'm taking that approach is if we understand why, why God created us, for what reason, what was his purpose, I feel that we would be better in a better place to answer the question, what is our standard of living? What is our standard, our rules of engagement? Right. So that is the reason why I'm taking that approach. So anyway, let me see <laughs> if it makes sense to you. But if you go back to Ephesians chapter one, uh, you know, if you remember, the Apostle Paul tells us that he created us to be holy, to be blameless. And this is very important. He predestined us for adoption to sonship. Right. So uh, I, I highlight that aspect of adoption to sonship because the relational reality becomes extremely uh, vivid uh, there, right? Uh, the relationship that God wanted to have with us. First and foremost, he wanted to relate with us, but the relationship he wanted to, wanted, uh, wanted to have with us was not of master and slave, but of father and child, okay? Um, but for a relationship to work, there has to be some rules of engagement. And so that is what hopefully we will discuss as we move along. As we, as we proceed from here, I want to just revisit a question that we constantly ask. And let me see if uh, I can uh, bring this out to lay the groundwork for our further discussion. And the question is, and I'm sure you will, uh, you know, you'll probably uh, be able to predict what I'm going to ask. Who is God? Right. Remember, I asked the question, what was God's purpose to create? But I think a more fundamental question is, who is this God who creates? Right? So we understand and know from all our study and reformation that God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit who lives in absolute goodness, goodness is manifest in him. Goodness is the hallmark of who he is. In other words, he's not evil. He's not, uh, you know, uh, he does not do things which are wrong, bad. But goodness is uh, the very hallmark of who he is. Father, Son, Holy Spirit because of that goodness, live in limitless, unmeasurable joy, enjoying one another in complete selflessness. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, give way to each other in mutual indwelling and allowing to indwell one another, perfectly sharing in the life of the other. Right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit are glorious, living in glory, giving glory to one another, receiving glory, and together existing in glorious bliss. As Jesus said, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit lives in a way that nothing can separate them. Nothing can interrupt their relational oneness. They are a communion of intimacy. They are a communion of harmony and beauty. Though Father, Son, Holy Spirit are distinct persons, they maintain that distinction, yet they are not lost in their differences. Right? They are united without losing that distinction. And of course, Father, Son, Holy Spirit perhaps is one of the best examples of unity in diversity, right? So <laughs> I've used a lot of adjectives there. And I, there's a reason why I'm using all those adjectives. Father, Son, Holy Spirit are the perfect, are the perfection of communion beyond our com comprehension and understanding. And here is my question that I want to challenge you with. Why? Why are they such a perfection of communion, right? What is the rules of engagement between them that they would live in such enjoying 
you know, marvelous bliss. What is the rules of engagement? They are relational, right? And I have only one explanation for them. I, I have only one explanation, and that's the words I borrow from Jesus Christ our Lord. John 17 and verse 24, where he says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you loved me before the creation of the world. You loved me before the creation of the world. Right? Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful for humankind to live like that? For all of us as human beings to live in that sense of perfect communion. And that is what the Father is, I mean, that is what Jesus is praying to the Father. Father, he says, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. The intention for the creation of humanity by Father, Son, Holy Spirit is so that we can enjoy that sense of oneness, togetherness, unity, and diversity, perfection of communion and all of that. What would it take for us to realize that? Well, <laughs> uh, it takes much more than just the Ten Commandments. And listen to me as I carry on. Okay, so his creation started. Adam and Eve. And what were they expected to do? To live within the covenant relationship. God wanted Adam and Eve to enjoy uh, life with him as he walked in the cool of the day to live within, within that promise that God made them that I am making a covenant to with humanity that they will enjoy my love, right? And what did Adam and what did Adam and Eve have to do? They had to believe God. First and foremost, they had to believe God, believe that He is trustworthy, that He is He is. Oh, he is what he says he is. So they had to believe God. They had to trust God. They had to have faith in him. Notice, belief, trust, faith. Very, very important. It comes before anything else. Those were the rules of engagement, you could, you could say. In other words, God wanted Adam and Eve to trust God to himself, not trust themselves. But what happened? God said, don't eat of the tree of the good and evil. And they decided to distrust God and hence went ahead and decided to live by trusting themselves, trusting their own decisions rather than trusting God. And what happened? We call it the fall. You know, <laughs> theologically, we call it the fall. And what was the result of all of that? And then, you know, as you read from Genesis 1 right up to 6 and 7 and 8, uh, you had uh, uh, the Tower of Babel, uh, you had the Flood, uh, you had more and more and more rebellion, right? It became so, humanity became so rebellious, like I mentioned, the Flood, that God had to, uh, you know, wipe them out in a Flood. Humanity lost their sense of right and wrong because humanity did not trust God to tell him what was right and wrong. They decided for themselves what was right and wrong. So they lost the sense of right and wrong. They became so corrupted, lovers of themselves, that God had to, uh, you know, uh, sort of take them through, the, through those horrible situations of being scattered, the flood, uh, you know, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, and all of those things. Okay, so we'll fast forward now. Come to Abraham. All right. Then what happens? God does not abandon mankind. God continues to work with man. He started with Abraham then. He made a covenant with Abraham. What was the covenant that God made with Abraham? Let me just bring uh, my, my scripture on the screen. Uh, just give me a moment. Okay. Oops, sorry. Just lost. All right. Right. All right. I hope you can see my uh, 
my screen. Okay, here is uh, uh, what the what the Lord said to Abraham, Genesis chapter twelve. Okay. Uh, maybe Franklin can uh, mute himself. Uh, thank you. Genesis chapter twelve. Uh, the Lord said to Abraham, "Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you." I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now notice the covenant that God is making with Abraham. The covenant is unilateral or you could say it is unconditional. There are no conditions that God puts here by saying, I will bless you if you obey me. If you do this, if you do that, no, a covenant that God makes is a promise, not a proposal. It's not an agreement. It's a covenant. God says, whether you, I mean, whether you accept or not, I am, my intention is to bless you. See, that is the purpose with which God created us, to give us a blessing without any condition. Now, does that mean to say Abraham had no standards to live with? Does that mean to say Abraham had no rules of engagement in this, in this, uh, in this uh, covenant? Not that there is a condition to it. No. To come under the covenant, to enjoy the covenant, Abraham had to believe God. Remember belief. He had to believe God. Abraham had to trust God to leave his hometown and go to the you know, to another land. And Abraham had to have faith in him. Belief, trust, faith. Right? If Abraham responded that way, you know, when you have a covenant, when God is promising us something, we have to respond. That is what Abraham is doing. So that is, I would say, the rules of engagement, the standard. Right? Abraham respected God. He respected that relationship that God was making with him, right? And he wanted to do everything to preserve it, to accept it, to receive it, right? And if you remember, that faith was credited to him as righteousness. That is what the New Testament says. That faith was credited to him as righteousness. So it's important for us to know that... Uh, God is repeating the same promise from the beginning of creation. The reason he created was to bless us. And now he's telling Abraham, Abraham, Adam and Eve faulted. All the others faulted. Now I'm going to start afresh with you. And I want to make sure humanity will be blessed. So I want to start with you. Right. So in other words, God's original purpose is continuing to be maintained. Right. Okay. What happens then? Of course, once again, we will fast forward. All right? uh, we come to Israel, the nation of Israel. Right Now, God made a covenant with them. Right? Uh, what was that covenant? Let me just once again, uh, I think it's on the screen here. Yeah, Exodus chapter 6. Notice the covenant that God makes with Israel. Uh, beginning in verse 6. Therefore says to the Israelites, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from the from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from the from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore you swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give to you as a possession. I am the Lord. God is once again maintaining that original purpose, which he began from creation. He created us to bless us. And now, after Abraham, 400 years or so later, he is now forming this nation called Israel. He's slowly beginning to fulfill his promise, right? It's the same promise given to Abraham. 
I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will, and as he says here to the Israelites, I will take you as my own people. I will be your God. Relational. God wanted to have a relationship with humanity. And through Israel, he wanted to bless them. Okay, so the original purpose of God was being maintained. There's continuity in all of these covenants. Was there a condition? Did God say, I will make you my own only if you obey me? Well, actually, no. In this, in this point, at this point, there is no condition. It was an unconditional blessing. That's why we call it a covenant. Right? Now, does that mean to say Israel had no standard to live with? Does that mean to say Israel had no rules of engagement? I mean, they need to respond. How do they respond? Israel had to believe God, accept the promise of God, and have faith in it. Right? And have faith in it. And if they did that, they would come under the covenant promise. But Something interesting happens with Israel. Something came with the covenant. What was that? What was what what came along with the covenant? And uh, let's read in. And I'm going to the New Testament because it makes it very clear. In Galatians chapter three, notice what now happens uh, to the covenant. Galatians three was. Beginning in verse 16. God gave the promises to Abraham. Notice promises. A promise is without a condition. God gave the promises to Abraham and his child. Reference to Jesus Christ. The agreement or the covenant. A better word is covenant. God made with Abraham could not be cancelled. 430 years later. When, gave, when God gave the law to Moses. Now we come to the law. This is when we come to the law, right? The promise could not be cancelled because the law was given. The promise was a promise. It was unconditional. Now, what was the law for? Okay, let's keep reading. God would be breaking his promise. That is, if now God says, only if you keep the law, that the covenant will be fulfilled. Well, I mean... In that respect, God will be breaking the promise. Notice in verse 18, for if the inheritance, the covenant promise, could be received by keeping the law, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. But God graciously gave it to Abraham as a promise. So there was no law. There was, but there was there was there was rules of engagement. There, a relational a response was necessary. Right? So the covenant was unconditional, in other words. But now the big question comes in verse 19. Notice, why then, the apostle asks, was the law given? What was the reason for this law? And here is the answer. It was given alongside the promise, given alongside the promise. In other words, the covenant is different from the, from the law. The promise or the covenant is different from the law. It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child. Reference to Jesus Christ, who was promised. Jesus Christ was the promise ultimately through whom the covenant would ultimately be fulfilled. Okay. Uh, and in verse 21, I'm, I'm dropping down to verse 21. Is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not, the apostle says. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the scripture declares that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, mention a few things. I'll just knock off the screen. <laughs> let me just mention a few, few things. Let's remember one thing. The law was added to the covenant. There was no law, uh, codified law before. Okay, there, were, there was 
there was response. There was rules of engagement. There were standards by which we had to respond. But there was no law. The law came 400 years plus after Abraham. Right? The covenant came before. The promise came before. The covenant had priority. So the question was here. We have to ask is, and that was what the apostle asked, why was the law given? You see, the Israelites were a slave people for 400 plus years. They did not know how to live as a nation, as God's chosen nation. It was all new to them. They did not know what sin was. The law was to reveal to them what sin was because they didn't know what it was, right? They were committing sins in ignorance. I don't know if I've got a scripture there, but I'll just read you Hebrews chapter 9 verse 7 where it says, but only the high priest ever entered the most holy place and only once a year and he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins of the people had committed in ignorance. In other words, Israel, Israel as a nation were ignorant and were living ignorantly without not knowing at at all what was right and wrong, what was uh, sinful. So now that they had to live as God's people, now that they had to live representing God, now, they had, they had, now that they had to live under the covenant promise, right? Uh, they had some rules of engagement. Verse 19 once again asked the question, why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. Let me just go back to my screen. I just bring up some scriptures again, just to make it a little bit more clearer for all of us. All right. Yeah. Um, right. Let me just. Oops, sorry. I keep hitting the wrong button. All right. Okay, Hebrews 9, 7. Ah, this was the scripture I was quoting earlier. Sin, the people had committed in ignorance because they were ignorant. They didn't know that. Now notice here in Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Or rather, yeah, the, the question is in Galatians 3, why was the law given? Notice in Romans 3, 19, where it says, obviously the law applies to those to whom it was given for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses. And to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Israel did not know how sinful they were. right? They needed to know that they were sinners. So God had to teach them from scratch. That if they had to live within the covenant, they had a particular standard to follow and for them to understand that they need to recognize they were sinners and they were sinful and the law was given so that they would begin to recognize that, right? Notice, they could not do anything to merit a relationship with God, to earn a relationship with God. God already established that relationship. That was the covenant. But now they needed to trust God for salvation for being under that covenant. So an entire law system was given to them, governing all aspects of life, moral, community life, social life, how to worship God, ceremonies. All these things were added in the law that came 400 years after Abraham. God gave them laws that would compensate for their lack of civic experiences. It the This law system would help them resist paganism, laws that would help them become a distinct nation, laws that would help them be an organized society in a new land. These laws were good for their situation because they were ignorant. They were given a Levitical priesthood. Why? To mediate between God and them. It was the law system in its entirety was particularly meant for Israel as a nation so that they would understand and know that they were sinners and now to be able to enjoy and come and under the covenant 
uh, or God, the promise of God, they needed to recognize who they were. Nothing more but sinners, right? It was meant for them as a particular people at a particular time. The Apostle Paul says it was like a schoolmaster, if you remember that. It was like a schoolmaster. In other words, they were in KG class <laughs> to help them from an elementary uh, you know, perspective on what was right and wrong and how to relate with God. So the law was like a little child being led by God and help them understand. But now here is something very important for us to understand. Where did the law come from? The, 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 the character of the law is derived from God's overall standard. The law does not encapsulate the entire standard of God. And that is what I think sometimes we tend to miss out. This law for the nation of Israel, uh, its character was derived from God's overall standards. First and foremost, to believe in him and his promise. Then to trust him with it, have faith in him, then to respond in a way that would be an example to the nations around. So the, the law, including the Ten Commandments, was a entire package given to the nation of Israel. Right? Uh, so there was continuity of the standard of engagement because the law had God's standards in it. Uh, just as the covenant, the covenant was continuing, the covenant that God had made with humanity, Adam and Eve, from the very beginning. Now the question we have to ask is, uh, what happened when Jesus came? When Jesus Christ came, what happened? What happened to this whole system? All right. Let us go then to uh, the next scripture, Hebrews chapter 8, if you can read uh, on the screen with me, beginning in verse 6. Notice what happened when Jesus came. But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood, for he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. What is this better? Better covenant, better promises. What does that mean? All right. That is why it is called a new covenant. Why is it called a new covenant when Jesus came? Because it is superior. It is better. It's more eternal in the it is in, in its perspective, in its in its in its uh, path, you know, get in its gamut. And it was made possible by Jesus Christ taking on human flesh. Living our lives, you know, in himself. He became the perfect response to God. He became the perfect response to God. God was always wanting us to respond, but we couldn't. We were always messing up. To such an extent where God had to take his people to KG class and help them understand. But Jesus Christ, when he came, he became the perfect response, which has now become ours. A new priesthood came into force. The Levitical priesthood was discontinued. The Mosaic law was fulfilled as, the, as, the, uh, as Matthew says. The Mosaic law, the law that was added to the covenant was fulfilled. In other words, rituals were fulfilled and superseded with a standard that remained from the beginning of creation. Jesus Christ removed the KG class cool master and he brought in a standard that continued from the very beginning of creation. All right. And what was Jesus able to accomplish through that? Notice in uh, Romans chapter uh, 7. No, no. Uh, sorry, this is this is another one. I'll just stop that there. Uh, uh, what, uh, what did Jesus accomplish through his new covenant? Hebrews chapter 9, let me read you from there. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able. In other words, the law system, 
the entire law system given to Israel was not able to cleanse the conscience of the people who bring them. The conscience needed to be clear. Not just uh, it, uh, uh, the, the, it was not just outward behavior that was you know that was uh, that God was looking for. It was an inner cleansing that was required, which the law could not do. So, when Jesus came, there is a fundamental change in the way now people relate to God. Right. Jesus, in his discourse with his disciples and then through uh, the scriptures to all of us, is basically trying to say the law system, which includes the Ten Commandments, are not sufficient for Christian behavior, where even the conscience is cleansed. The entire law system were given as a rule for Israelite behavior. That was the original intent of the law. Jesus said that morality, true morality, went beyond the words of the law, including the Ten Commandments. Jesus at one time said, you have observed the law, but you have not, you have ignored the weightier matters of the law. In other words, there was much more to the law than just the words, just the Ten Commandments. There are something called weightier matters, something unseen. The code, the Ten Codes, is, has something missing in it. It's not complete. There is something more, which Jesus terms it as the weightier matters. In Jesus Christ, uh, the covenant will include Writing the law in their hearts. In other words, it's an intensification so that transformation of the heart takes place. The conscience is now cleared of guilt. And that is where in Romans chapter 6, if I can, I just bring that up on the screen. Romans chapter 6, it's, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 7, it says, but now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Is there a law? Is there, is there a standard? Obviously, God is not saying there is no standard, but we are released from the law that bound Israel. And now we serve. This is the new way of serving and relating with God. We serve in the new way of the spirit not in the old way of the written code. So Christians today submit to a greater law, a law of the heart prompted by the Holy Spirit, not by the written code. If you notice in Romans chapter 13, that's on your screen at this moment, is, uh, it says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt, debt to love one another. For whoever loves uh, others one another, sorry, am uh, I reading the same thing? Yeah, right. Has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. In other words, the same standard that was from the beginning, love, which characterizes Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You remember I showed you why the Father, Son, Holy Spirit live in such perfect harmony? Because of love. Jesus Christ is restoring us to the greater commandment of love. So, question to be asked, are we Christians under the Ten Commandments. My answer to that is Christians are under a greater commandment. Right? Uh, much greater than the Ten Commandments. 
what Christians submit to is far superior in the words of the scriptures. The standard is far superior, that of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. In that respect, we have superseded the Ten Commandments. Our righteousness should far exceed that of the Pharisees, who are very good in observing the Ten Commandments. But is there a continuity from the Ten Commandments? Obviously, the Ten Commandments are part of the character of God. But it is not the sum total of the character of God. For Christians in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. He is the perfect standard. And this is very important. He, he is the perfect standard. We are to conform to his image. That is the goal of the law. As it says, the end of the law is Christ. The goal of the law is to become like Christ. In Christ, we have the standard and the solution. When we fail to observe, he forgives us and imputes his righteousness to us and saves us. That is why we need Jesus, not the law. Because he becomes the law for us. In the Ten Commandments, we only have a partial standard which cannot clear our consciences, which cannot transform us, and finally only ends up in death because the transgression of it is death. But in Jesus, we have the perfect standard far exceeding the ten and the solution where he gives us uh, life, life eternal. Finally, let me give you one more scripture. Uh, I just want to complete with this. Let me end with Romans chapter 13, reading from verse 1. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Verse 13, let us behave decently. Here is the engage. This is here is the standard. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, notice verse 14, very important. Clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he and he alone is the perfect standard that we are to look to, not any written code. I will now come to the question that uh, I think Bertie asked last time and very, give me just a few moments to complete this. Uh, Bertie asked, I think, Bertie, perhaps you were referring to these, maybe these two command, uh, to these two scriptures in John 15. It says, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Uh, right. And something very similar to that, John 14. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Uh, uh, am I right, Bertie? Is, uh, is that the question that you had asked? Uh, can you unmute yourself and just uh, let me know? Yes, you're right, Mr. Zakra, but it's still, it is Christ-centered. Okay. Uh, as you say, we are clothed with Christ yeah. and do not uh, move into the flesh, yeah, because yeah. Christ Let, is there for us. Let me just uh, uh, briefly answer that, and then I will end with uh, one short uh, anecdote. Um, notice the notice in the, in the law, I mean, notice in the scripture, it says, if you, what? Keep my command. My command. Uh, did you know? <laughs> did you notice that? Okay. Did you? And then the second scripture: If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Uh, what is my commandments? What is Jesus' commandments? Let me indulge me for a few moments. Jesus said, "You have heard." You remember that? He says, you have heard this, 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 this. But I tell you, 
Can we take that as Jesus Christ's commandments? You have heard, do not be, do not kill. But I tell you, can we take that as God's commandments or Jesus' commandments? If you say yes to that, now let me give you Jesus' commandments and indulge me for just a few moments. What does Jesus say? I tell you, do not be angry. I tell you, do not lust. I tell you, do not divorce. Do not divorce except for adultery. I tell you, do not swear an oath. I tell you, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. I tell you not to practice your righteousness in front of others. I tell you, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. I tell you, when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. I tell you, um, do not store up treasure for yourselves on earth. I tell you, do not worry about your life when you will eat or drink about your body, what you will wear. May I continue? To give you Jesus Christ's <laughs> commandments. I tell you, indulge me for a few moments. I tell you, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. I tell you, do not judge or you too will be judged. I tell you, enter through the narrow gate. I tell you, watch out for the false prophets. I tell you, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven. I tell you, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. I tell you, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Jesus Christ, <laughs> my commandments, his commandments. And Jesus says, therefore, if anyone hears the words of mine and puts them into practices, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. If you keep my commands, you shall abide in my love. I just gave you a sampling of Jesus Christ's commandments. Let me end by giving you a, a, a story, a true story that happened several years back when Ireland was in war. Uh, you remember the strife that was taking place in Ireland. And uh, Catholics were fighting Protestants. Uh, England uh, they didn't like England, the England occupying part of their land. And so the IRA, the Irish Republican Army was formed. And uh, uh, there was a man called Gordon Wilson. And he had a daughter whose name was Marie, who was 20, 20 years of age. They were attending a ceremony to honor the British soldiers who lost their lives. It was called Remembrance Day. But when they were in this place where they were attending, bombs went off, planted by the IRA. And they were close to some kind of a wall and a wall fell on the two of them, Gordon Wilson and his daughter Marie, right? And they were pinned down by the wall falling on them. And they were still alive, the father, Gordon, Wilson was trying to reach out for his daughter and asked, Marie, are you okay? And she said, yes. Three times he asked. She said, yes. The fourth time she, uh, he asked, the daughter Marie said, Daddy, I love you very much. And those were the last words she spoke to her father. Uh, she died. But Gordon Wilson, the father, survived. And this is the statement that he made in hospital when he was asked by a reporter. He said, I have lost my daughter and we shall miss her. But I bear no ill will. I bear no grudge. Dirty sort of talk is not going to bring her back to life. I shall pray for those people tonight and every night, referring to the bomb, the people who killed her daughter. And he ends by saying, may God forgive them. When people heard what he said, they said, are you mad? 
How could you forgive your daughter's killers? He just kept quiet. All I can say is, he was a Christian. He lived by the law of love. He lived by the law of Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you very much. Floor is open for any questions. <laughs> we have not much time, but uh, uh, any thoughts you'd like to share? Pin drop silence. Come on, guys, say something. Yes, Bertie, go ahead. Do unmute yourself. Uh, I think you. we can't hear you, Bertie. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I read somewhere that uh, we Christians who um, are believing and trusting the same words you're using and, you know, uh, we receive Christ as our as a Lord and Savior, we believe in heart. He is alive. He is... And I read somewhere where it's written, mentioned that uh, we are there, we Christians are there to witness to the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, not hide our light. As we know, when we believe Christ, we see Christ uh, in our hearts. And he is doing, a, you know, we are working, a pro we are working in progress. The Holy Spirit, we have received the true Holy Spirit, and uh, we are being sanctified. Uh, we have been justified, sanctified, we received Christ, justified, sanctified, and we look forward to glory. Uh, as you rightly know, I'm saying this, Zechariah, just for all the others to hear, for all the others to hear, you know, the commandments written in our hearts, when you receive Christ, and you mention so many commands, but all that to do with love. And uh, uh, we need Christ in us, uh, you know, to be, uh, you know, to grow a work in progress. We all are work in progress uh, at different levels of conversion. And we're learning and growing, hopefully. And uh, thank you so much for, for so, uh, you know, eloquently, uh, elaborately, you know, bringing us to Christ. And he is the law of love to us. But then, uh, it says, as I said, let me repeat again. It says that we are instructed. That we are instru I read that we, to we are we are we have come to believe in Christ and we receive. We come to accept the salvation God offers in Christ. But we are called to witness to the Lord Jesus Christ and not hide our light. Uh, it may help help, help us all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I can just say, yeah, that's also a commandment of Jesus Christ. Go and preach yeah. the gospel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what, that's what, yeah. So that means to say we have to be a witness for Christ, right? Yes, that is also part of the commandment. And another another place I read, which very, can be helpful to each one of us, where we're evangelizing. Sometimes I battle, you know, I sort of struggle with the thought, how do I go about doing it? You know, I said, stand there, give a track or, you know, tell them how to start. But it says... We, yeah. we should not, we should, evangelism is really, really, are we, if we have to really evangelize uh, as a, uh, as the God would like us to do it, as we witness to Christ, we have to love and respect others. Uh, yeah, evangelism is a big subject. Of course, it's a different one. Uh, but yes, uh, there are various ways of doing that. And uh, yeah. sometimes we are, we are limited in the way we do it. But then, yes. Uh, in, in love and respect. Yeah, but we, we, we can still do it, you know, by being a witness, sometimes by action, by sometimes by words, uh, you know, in various ways. But yeah, maybe we'll we'll discuss that at another time. But yes, that is very much part of our our rules of engagement. <laughs> Puri Murthy, go ahead. Yeah. Unmute. Uh, you can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. You have heard it said, keep the Sabbath. But I tell you, so such sort of comparison does not exist. As regarding the Sabbath, such a statement does not exist. 
point number one. Point number two, wherever the word law occurs in New Testament several times, the Greek word is nomen. It is the same word referring to the five books of Moses, Torah. So, the apostles say you have to keep the law. At the time, in those places, it should have been translated as Torah. So that confusion still arises. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if I understood your question. I mean, I'm not sure if you're making a statement. You you first oh, said... Two, two statements. Oh, okay, okay. Right. Uh, you said that uh, you have heard to keep the Sabbath, but... <laughs> I tell you. I tell you, <laughs> so that Such doesn't make is not there. Right, yeah, yeah. I'm presuming, I, I don't know if I'm right, but I'm presuming that by saying that you are, uh, 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 you're probably alluding to the fact that the Sabbath still exists. Is that right? No. <laughs> to what level it stands in, stands enhanced. Aha, okay, okay. I mean, that is, that is very clear. The, the Sabbath, uh, you know, Matthew 11, Jesus says, I am the rest. Uh, we we have now eternal rest. We don't have just a 24-hour rest. We have eternal rest. Jesus Christ has become our Sabbath. And so the ritualistic aspect of it does not apply, but the, the, uh, the, the weightier matter of it is that Jesus Christ is our rest. That is why our so, works will not give us salvation. So I was referring to the weightier matter of the Sabbath. <laughs> okay. Well said. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Got a minute? So Rao, you had a thought? Yeah, go ahead. <coughs> what to say, sir? You're able to hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh... See, sir, you are uh, you are saying only response to the God's uh, uh, way of life, something. You are totally uh, omitting the word obey. You never said anything about obedience. Uh, yeah, am I right? You can you can uh, replace the word response with obedience. Yeah. So, if obedience is there, what to obey? Wow. <laughs> I, I I thought I just said what to obey. <laughs> no, sir. Uh, <coughs> you said same thing, but with different words. What I am saying, you are also saying, but. I am saying with okay. some particular word, you are okay. saying with some other word. Okay, One maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. G mm. uh, God created human beings and said, I want you to be my people. Mm. Yes. Will you obey? Yeah. That's your response? Yes. So, if you want so, to obey, obey, if you want to obey, yeah. okay, tell me. If you want to obey, you must believe. Yes, I believe you, God. Yeah, I, yeah. I trust you that you are for me, that you are not created yeah. me to destroy me. Right? I will have faith in you. And I will do everything to maintain that relationship. That means I will love you in such a way where I will constantly keep responding and participating with you. Yeah. Right. True, sir. And it goes to so many aspects of life, even the way you think. Yeah, agree. And that is what Jesus helped us to even clear our conscience. I don't know. Mm. I'm forgetting what you said. Say it again. 
just to response to you i want to respond to you i mean you was you use the word obey i can, you can very much use the word obey not a problem uh, i i feel the word response is a better word because uh, god is showing us something yeah, he is can... us to participate and respond to his promise he is making us a promise yeah. and so the word response is a better word than than obey i would think yeah it is actually one and the same sir only thing you are saying uh, response i am saying obey okay yeah. but response what what is that response how do you respond first of all if you believe in christ if you trust in christ and if you believe trust and if you have faith then only you will obey whatever whatever he yeah. says okay so trust without faith anything nobody can uh, i think i don't think anybody can do anything if you okay. have christ in you then right. only you will be him okay so if i can just mm. if if i can just tell you mm. you have faith in christ you believe yeah. christ you, yeah. you 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 trust him yeah. now he tells you mm. your enemies will you huh? obey huh? he says love your enemies yeah we should love will you obey yeah <laughs> we have to because he said that absolutely that's what i'm saying we are human beings who we may not have that strength if god god has to give us that strength yeah so what you're saying is i don't know what you're saying i mean you you i mean i'm asking you i'm giving you what to obey that mm. is only one point mm. and uh, what's the problem there is so much to obey see sir and uh, 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 what i believe is saying with an example i have i have son with me okay sir i i tell him to do not to do i mean not to steal not to say uh, wrong things uh something like that good things i tell him to do but i if i am a good father i will always love him even if he doesn't obey me 100% but i expect him to listen to my words if he doesn't obey me also i don't think i will condemn him i still love him that is the case with god excellent that is god's yeah. character but yeah. may i may i say something yeah now that your son is uh, in his 40s mm. will you give him daily laws to obey see if it that is the problem nowadays with the children <laughs> huh? no we hope huh? that they have matured so that they understand and know what they need to do and that is yeah. what jesus christ came to establish yes sir so if they know it to to obey this father he should obey if he doesn't obey still father will tell him somehow and it is his duty to tell him if Sir, he doesn't uh, yeah what <laughs> i have said this before and i'll say it again i don't think we can take more time we have already passed that by uh, the new covenant has we have to serve him in the new way of the spirit which is the law of love with the holy spirit prompting us and what is love love sir what is love love it is oh my god you may include a little better standard but it doesn't mean the lower standard is done away nothing like that i don't think uh, you can say that if you are messed up enough because in the new you... testament sir in the new testament wherever apostles are the people uh, god servants whatever they are saying they say god's love is there he is the savior he saves not the law i accept that but uh, what i am saying again uh, uh, let can uh, we again, yeah. what they are saying don't sin every every a chapter that wordings are there 
every chapter every uh, um, apostle they are saying don't sin don't sin so what does it mean sir actually don't sin means if there is no law there is no sin so if the sin is no. there for you the law uh, for you sin is only breaking of the law nothing more lot more but that ah, is the thing that is mr. the thing yeah mm -hmm. mr Rao, i feel you and i are saying the same thing yeah i have that said that before that i have you and i are saying the same thing it is just using different semantics yeah. all right uh, and so i feel that uh, you know uh, we have sorted out the problem I don't think no, sir, uh, we are not started out. You still say the law is not there, but you say you respond. respond I am not saying say. it. I am not saying it. Paul the apostle is saying. I am no, not saying. I, I have no guts to say that. <laughs> I don't agree with that. Sorry. Well, I mean, uh, see, once again, semantics. It's all semantics. You say it in this way. I it say it in another way. way. Yeah. So it is. It there is no contradiction. We should sit. together not in this i right. think we should discuss it yes we shall uh, do that the last uh, episodes are last last week one is it in the youtube or uh, anywhere it is not there pravin will know i don't know pravin it's not uploaded i just returned to hyderabad i have to take some time to edit and put uh, put it in youtube i want to go through everything in that i want to uh, write down the points sir uh, and then yeah. i want to i think uh, say i think that is much better so that yeah. uh, we can clarify on point by point basis yeah but, but thank you so much i'm sorry that we have gone slightly over time this subject uh -huh. five minutes will never end <laughs> but uh, god bless you all and let's end with a prayer let me uh, lead you in a closing prayer loving gracious father we just thank you that uh, uh that you are such a loving god and uh, what a tremendous purpose you have for us father that you want to have a relationship with us even to the extent where you want to dwell with us we look forward to that fullness of that promise thank you lord jesus for being our rest thank you for being our perfect standard and when we falter thank you that your blood covers us we ask for your blessings upon all of us as we move forward in our lives knowing that you are the real true and only standard for us as christians in jesus name i pray amen god bless you all take care amen <laughs>